finally tonight, we remember and hear from author and Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Tony Horwitz. He died suddenly yesterday of an apparent cardiac arrest. Horwitz was best known as the author of Confederates in the Attic, a look at modern day Southern attitudes about the Civil War and the people who reenact it. The book was a bestseller. As a journalist, he covered conflicts in the Middle East, Africa, and the Balkans for the Wall Street Journal. He won the Pulitzer in 1995 for a series on income inequality and low-wage jobs, including working at chicken processing plants in the South. A number of Horwitz's books are told through the narrative of first-person account. That's true of his latest book, Spying on the South. William Brangham recently sat down with him about it. Here's that interview. Almost 160 years ago, with America on the brink of civil war, a young writer from Connecticut was sent south to file regular dispatches from the so-called Cotton Kingdom of the slaveholding states. That reporter was Frederick Law Olmsted, the man who'd later gain international renown as the designer and architect of Central Park in Manhattan, the Capitol Grounds in Washington, and many other famous sites. A few years ago, another writer from the North, Pulitzer Prize winner Tony Horwitz, recreated Olmsted's trek state by state, often using similar modes of transport and painting similarly indelible portraits of the people he met. The resulting work is called Spying on the South, an Odyssey Across the American Divide, and Tony Horwitz joins me now. Welcome back to the News Hour. Thanks for having me again. I have to admit, this book was such a surprise to me. As a former New Yorker and now someone who lives in Washington, D.C., I have spent many, many hours in the, in the genius creations of Frederick Law Olmsted and had no idea that he was a writer and a good one and a good reporter. Mm -hmm. How did you find this story and decide this is what you wanted to do? Uh, the true story is that it happened while I was cleaning house. Um, my wife and I live in a... Uh, an old farmstead in Massachusetts where everything sags and uh, our overflowing books don't help. And while sorting through them as we were fighting over shelf space, I rediscovered The Cotton Kingdom, a book that grew out of Umstead's reporting that I had been assigned in college. And I dove back into it and was just instantly captivated by his vivid writing about the South. Can you give us a sense of what was it that he was reporting? We know where America was roughly on the mm -hmm. cusp of the Civil War, but he was doing this for a northern audience. What were, the, what were the stories, what were the dispatches he was sending back north? Well, he was sent by the New York Times, uh, which had just opened shop and uh, saw itself as the temperate and measured voice uh, of reason at a time when papers were very overheated and partisan. And so they wanted a, a quite a sober analysis of the South's economy and society. But Olmsted is this very intrepid and adventurous fellow who's constantly wandering away from his beat into whatever you know, uh, he was curious about. So uh, he'd wander through the open door of a black church in New Orleans and then write about the service that he witnessed or what it was like staying at the homes of poor whites where he often lodged on the road at night. He would just knock on the door and pay them a dollar for food and lodging. So he really wrote about the everyday fabric of life in the South, or that was the strength of his writing. I mean, he wasn't an anti-slavery crusader, right? I mean, he did mm -hmm. report on the, the gruesomeness that he mm -hmm. saw, but he wasn't there to try to convince the North of the rightness of the cause. When he sets off, he's by no means an abolitionist. He's actually quite in line with Lincoln at that time. In the course of his journey, his views harden when he sees slavery up close and he sees the intransigence of slaveholders who he realizes are willing to fight rather than give an inch. Uh, so while he doesn't become an abolitionist really until the Civil War, uh, his views uh, become harder and harder as he uh, travels the South. So you rediscover these works, and you decide, I'm going to do this too. What, what were you hoping to do? Well, one, I was just, I identified with Olmsted. I was a, a newspaper you correspondent. You wander off your beat all the time. For many years, <laughs> uh, abroad and at home, complaining about my desk and my blown out of, uh, expense budget, as Olmsted does in his personal letters. And I liked his spirit of 
uh, just approaching strangers and ordinary people rather than you know so-called experts and and other sources that uh, journalists often rely on um, to just um, sense what he called the drift of things. And, and I, I liked that, and I thought, well, here we are at another moment of national fracture. I will ret retrace his journey to see uh, what he saw then and what I see now um, at another moment of polarization. As you say, he's setting off when the country is on the cusp of civil war. We're obviously not that. But as you, were, you write, I want to read a quote from here. This is 150 years later. You write that you found inescapable echoes of the 1850s, extreme polarization, racial strife, demonization of the other side, embrace of inflamed opinion, over-reasoned dialogue and debate. Obviously, we have changed. We're not at war. But do you see those similarities that strongly? I think all of all of those things hold. Uh, there are real echoes of the 1850s. I mean, you know, obviously entirely different eras, different issues. So I wouldn't want to overplay it. Uh, but you know, we are really shouting at and past each other in a way that's quite rem reminiscent. Um, and our government uh, seems paralyzed by its divisions, as it was in the 1850s. A loss of faith in our institutions. So I don't think we're on the cusp of violent breakup, and I certainly hope not. Uh, I certainly think uh, there are warnings to be found in what Olmsted described in the 1850s. We had Jared Diamond on the show a few days ago, and he was arguing that political polarization is one of the greatest threats to our democracy. But you're more optimistic about the, the, the ability of the country to get past these divisions, right? Well, I think the divisions are certainly exaggerated, uh, both by uh, people who, who want to exploit our differences for political or other gain, uh, but also by social media and the ways that we inhabit our separate silos and precincts. And when you do, as I did, go out for a long period and meet people on bar stools and in churches and workplaces in their homes, uh, we may have very different views, but we can sit down and, and discuss them in a civil and even friendly manner. Uh, does that solve the problem? Uh, no, but I think it lowers the temperature uh, on our conflict, which I do think uh, can get uh, uh, amplified by our media and politics. The book is Spying on the South. Tony Horowitz, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. That interview was conducted earlier this month. Tony Horwitz died yesterday at the age of 60.